so much, worship team. Powerful worship. Thank you for leading us. If you don't know me, my name is John Smart, and I'm one of the pastors here. If uh, we haven't had the chance to meet, I'd love to say hey after the service in the front row or the foyer or wherever. Um, real quick, could we welcome those that are joining us online or watching in the chapel? Uh, we're so glad that you're with us. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you this morning. Um, I just have one quick announcement, and then we're going to keep moving in our series this morning. And that announcement is midweek. If you have not had an opportunity to stop by, we would love to have you. That is our Wednesday night service where we have an opportunity just to go a little bit deeper. Um, so right now we're studying the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, this Wednesday we're going to be talking about prophecy. We have a meal uh, that we would love to share with you. And so you can sign up for that online or at our Welcome Center or um, anywhere you find the World Wide Web. You can sign up for that. And so... Uh, we would love to have you join us. That said, I'm going to read a uh, portion of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and then we're going to work through it. This is all about singleness. So we're talking about singleness today. Last week, we talked about uh, to the married couples. Now we're talking to those that are single, ready to mingle or not. And so I'm going to pick it up in verse 25. It is a sizable portion of Scripture, but we're going to work our way through it. Paul says, now, about virgins, or the unmarried, or the single. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, where scholars think there was a famine, I think that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Don't seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers, don't laugh at that if you're married. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it was not theirs to keep. And those who use the things of the world as if they were not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Paul's telling us, hold everything loosely. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs and how he can please the Lord. But the married man is concerned about the affairs of this world and how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world and how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but so that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. And if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably towards the virgin he's engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. He should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind and who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord, must be a believer. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think I too have the Spirit of God. Let me pray, and then we'll work through what all that means. Lord Jesus, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place this morning. We're not here because we want to play church. We want to play games. We want to hear from you. And so we know your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. We know it's powerful. We don't have to drum anything up to make it powerful. It's, it's life-changing on its own, Lord. We ask that you'd help us to hear your words. We ask that you'd give us hearts to receive what you say, that we would leave here changed because we had an encounter with the living God. And so we invite you in the next few moments, Holy Spirit. Be close to us. Speak to us as your sons and daughters. In your name we ask these things. Amen. I wonder when the last time it was, if you can think of a time, that you received a gift uh, that you didn't really want. Um, there's a time that comes to mind for me. And that was, uh, I have a family member. My, my uh, grandma is very good at giving gifts, very intentional at giving gifts. And um, she uh, knew that I wanted, when I was a kid, she knew 
All right, let's just turn the phones off now. I just feel like a spirit of phone calls in the room right now for whatever reason. Um, no, she knew that I wanted a Game Boy. It's an elementary school. She knew I wanted a Game Boy. And um, so she liked going to yard sales. So she would go to yard sales, and she was looking, you know, for presents that she could pick up for me and my brothers. And uh, she got me a Game Boy at a yard sale and brought it back. I was super excited, opened it up, got you this Game Boy. The only problem was it wasn't a Game Boy. It was a Fun Boy is what it was called. <laughs> and so you can imagine <laughs> the off-brand Game Boy that a Fun Boy is. They couldn't, they wanted to use Pikachu, but Pikachu was trademarked. So instead of that, there was a yellow mouse on it in an American flag tank top. This was like the logo. And I'll never forget the catchphrase for the fun boy, which was to have a good time for family. And I thought, wow, this is not really what I wanted. This is not exactly the Game Boy that I was expecting. It had like an AM, FM button on there and stuff like that. I was like, this is not what I was really anticipating. I say that because I want to talk today about a gift um, that most people who have it don't really want it. And that would be the gift of singleness. That's not everybody. I know some people are single, very secure, very content, very happy. Um, but Paul gets into the idea of singleness in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Last week, we talked about marriage. Um, here's what's really interesting. Did you know about 40%, if you look at churches in America, 40% of those who attend church are single. And if you look at Protestant churches in Maryland, that number rises to about 50%. All right, and so if um, on any given weekend, our church tends to skew a little younger, I think it's very easy to assume even more than 50% of those who attend Lighthouse Church may not be married. With that, um, I have been out of the old single game for a while now, and so i um, been married 10 years in August, and so I texted and reached out to a number of people who have been single either for a period of time, some have been single for a long time, some were single for a long time, recently got married, some men, some women, and I just asked, um, what's some of the best advice you've gotten from the church? What's some of the worst advice that you've gotten from the church? And then what would you tell the singles in Lighthouse Church? And I took that, and it was extremely helpful. And so thank you so much if you were one of those that I reached out to. Um, it actually changed the way that I'm going to address this, this sermon today. But I want to share with you some of the bad advice that singles in Lighthouse have received. Number one, your, your time will come when you stop looking for it. You aren't finding your significant other because you aren't close enough to God. Ooh, yeah. If you said that, I bet you feel bad right now. <laughs> Well, what's wrong now? He, she, they're good enough. Just give them a try. Trust me, it's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> and then, this is a direct quote. Someone got very honest and said the following. No one talks about how being in a season of singleness can be devastatingly painful. Seeing your friends and family experience all the things you so deeply long for is rough. And I think it changes and evolves as you age. It feels like a deeper hurt as you get older and possibly see less chance of it happening for you. People say all the time, he'll give you the desires of your heart, but it doesn't feel like that applies. You almost feel like you're a caveat to that scripture. Actually, you feel like you're a caveat to most things in life. You don't fit in with your married friend groups. Singles groups are creepy. So you try men and women's groups, which end up being worse because they just all talk about their relationships. I guess what I'm trying to say is it feels like a lonely road to walk with not a lot of insight on how to keep the faith. All that said, being single in 2024 is very difficult. There's, and what I want to say, what, I think what Paul is saying in this passage is there's challenges to being single, but there's also opportunities and promises. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work through this together. And if you're not single, if you're married, um, and... Uh, uh, you're thinking, okay, well, maybe this message isn't for me. I hope this message will also be for you in that, hopefully, as we learn what the Bible has to say about singleness, we can help the people, friends, family in our lives that are single. We can come alongside them a little better and not tell them it's not because you don't love God enough. So uh, what I want to do is I want to teach through this passage, and to do that, I want to contrast what Paul says 
with some myths that show up in culture and even in church culture about singleness. And I sort of want to compare and contrast the two. And so we're going to get started right now. Number one, here's the first myth. The myth of the gift of singleness. This is what Paul says. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each of us has his own gift from God one kind of gift for one and one kind for another. Now, here's what I believe. I believe there is such a thing as the gift of singleness, but it's not what I grew up hearing it was. Here's what I grew up hearing the gift of singleness was. Maybe you heard something like this, that the singleness gift is this. There's people who want to get married, and that's great for them. And then there's people who don't want to get married, and being single is just easy. It's no problem. It's no struggle. They never want to get married. They never want to have kids. It's not really an issue. There's no temptation that comes with it. And for people like that, that is called the gift of singleness. And for everybody else, it's called something else. That is not what I would describe the gift of singleness as. Here's what I would describe it as. If you're single, anybody single in this room? You want to put your hand up? There you go. See? Yeah. Yeah. Now look around. I'm trying to help you. Help you. If you just put your hand up, you have the gift of singleness. That if you're single, you have the gift. You may not want the gift. You may have the gift for a short period of time and then get married. You may have the gift for a longer period of time. But I think what Paul is saying is the gift of singleness is if you're single, you have the gift. Now, maybe your response to that would be, I don't want this gift. I'm on apps, and I'm on dating sites, and I'm putting flyers up at Costco trying to get rid of this gift. And I totally get it. At the same time, like what we're learning in midweek about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, God is the one who gives us gifts according to his wisdom. And having a gift of God does not mean that it's easy, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's what you would choose for this season. So case in point, I think one of my gifts uh, is the gift of teaching. You may disagree with that after this sermon. Doesn't mean it's always easy. There's sometimes it, it takes a tremendous amount of work to put a teaching together. It doesn't mean it's not a gift. Also, it doesn't mean there's other gifts that I would want that I do not have. I would love to be able to lead worship. Looks fun, doesn't it? Up here with your friends playing music. I'd want that gift. They've told me no, you don't have that gift. You need to leave worship practice now, John. You need to go. So the gift of God doesn't necessarily mean it's easy. A gift of God doesn't necessarily mean it's what you want. So what is it? What, what, <laughs> then in what sense is it a gift? Here's what it means. That there are opportunities and advantages to that that you would not have otherwise. There's opportunities in singleness. There's an advantage in singleness that you would not have if you were married. Elizabeth Elliot um, who was married three times. Her first two husbands passed away. She was married to a very famous missionary named Jim Elliott, um, who died trying to take the gospel to unreached people groups. We actually uh, named my third son, we gave his middle name as Elliot, named after this family. So she spent, she was married for a couple years, she was single for a number, number of years, and this is what she said. Having now spent more than 41 years single, I have learned that it is indeed a gift not one I would choose, not one many women would choose, but we do not choose our gifts, remember? We are given them by a divine giver who knows the end from the beginning and wants above all else to give us the gift of himself. And what she's saying is now looking back, I realize there was opportunities and advantages and in the midst of that season, God was drawing me closer and closer to himself. I may not have chosen it, but it's still a gift from God. Second myth <clears throat> is the myth of the incomplete single. This is the idea that you are sort of half a person until you're in a relationship. As Dean Martin saying, you ain't nobody until somebody loves you. I think Demi Lovato did her own take on that recently. This is what Paul says. In my judgment, talking about being single, she is happier if she stays as she is. Now, this is what's crazy to me. Paul, all the time, he's not super concerned if people are happy. You read through the New Testament, Paul was fine to lay down the hammer if he thought people were happy and they should not have been happy. Paul talks a lot more about holiness than he does about happiness. Nevertheless, in this scenario, he goes, actually, I feel like those who are single are happier. And Paul, most scholars believe, had been married at one time. 
We're not sure what happened, but Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. To be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. So one of two things happened. Either one, Paul's wife passed away, or two, Paul's wife left him when he became a Christian. We're not sure exactly what happened there, but Paul has experienced both as a married person, as a single person. He goes, in my experience, he goes, I feel like she would be happier if she stayed as she was. Um, now that, nobody just broke out into applause, I understand. That is so difficult to believe in our culture where everything is geared towards the only way to be happy is to be in a romantic relationship. Top 10 songs, at almost any given time, the majority are gonna have to do with being in a relationship, a romantic relationship. Top movies have to do with that, top books have to do with that, the top TV shows. And so to take this idea that you can be fulfilled outside of a relationship, it is extremely difficult when everything in culture is telling us the opposite all the time. Nevertheless, Paul says, it's still a gift and there's still benefits and you can be completely fulfilled and satisfied. Not to say there's not wants or man, I'd want that, I wanna get married, I wanna have kids. Nevertheless, Paul goes, you're not an incomplete person. Um, sometimes the idea is I really wanna get in a relationship so I can be happy and I won't be lonely. The problem with that or the challenge with that is the loneliest people that I know, and probably the loneliest people you know, are not the people that are single, it's the people who are in unhappy marriages. That being married is no cure against loneliness. Being married is no cure against unhappiness. And what um, Paul is saying here is the point of life is to find and get to the place where you and Jesus are enough. And you can find that place being married you can find that place with kids crawling all over you like a jungle gym, or you can find that place in singleness, but everybody has to get to the point where you realize, man, it's me and Jesus. Why? Because outside of that, if we're not settled in that, I love being married, but if I took the expectation into my marriage that my wife would complete me, it would kill our marriage. If she did the same thing, it would kill our marriage. Um, because the idea is that Jesus is what I need to be completed. Third myth is the myth of JV spirituality. What's really interesting in church history when you look through it is for the first 50, the church has always ferried, uh, favored either being married or being single. And for the first 1,500 years of church history, the, the favored thing was to be single. That was seen as if you're single, you're really devoted to God, you're really making an impact, you're really sort of on the cutting edge. Then 500 years ago, that shifted. So now it's sort of seen as if you're married, now you're really in, now you're really mature, now you're really that. And so for those that are single, sometimes there's this thing that sort of hangs over them like, hey, I, I'm not, I haven't really made it. I can't really make an impact. I'm sort of a junior member of the church until I get married and have kids. And then I fully arrived and that is not biblical. The reason why the church for 1,500 years thought singleness was the way to go is because there's some heavy hitters in the church history that were single. People like the Apostle Paul, people like Jeremiah, people like Jesus, that they realized, man, you do not have to be married to have a full and complete life. You do not have to be married to make a huge impact for the kingdom of God, which is why Paul says, I would like you to be free from concern." An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs and how he can please the Lord, but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world and how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but so that you can live in the right way in undivided uh, devotion to the Lord. Why is, so why is singleness a gift? Because you can be all in. Because there's nothing holding you back. I, I love being married. I love having a family. But I will say this. I am so restricted like from the time I wake up until I crawl into bed at night, there are little people who are asking me things all the time. <laughs> like I don't have, I would love, sometimes people want to hang out or get coffee or do this or do that. Man, I would love to do that stuff. I have so limited time. Some of it is for sleep, not a whole lot of it, to be honest with you. 
that what Paul is saying is if you're unmarried for a season or for a longer period of time, you can live in such a way as to be fully devoted to Jesus. That singleness, to be honest, is a time because of the opportunities, because of the time, because of the flexibility where you can do one of two things. You can live really, really selfishly or you can live really unselfishly. And culture would say, hey, just do you. You're single, man, just use your extra money. Just travel, just do stuff. Just, just focus on you. Just stay home and chill. Paul is saying, make the most of the gift during the time that you have it. Make the most of the potential of the gift of singleness. Maybe you don't want it. Maybe you want it to end. Regardless, Paul would say, make the most of the time that you've been given. To be honest, I look back and I, I wasted so much of my time when I was single. I'm like, man, I could have done so much more. I just didn't realize it. One really important question to ask is, if you know what your calling is, you feel like maybe where God is leading you, would marriage help or would it hinder the calling that God has on your life? If you feel like God has called you to you know, be a missionary and do these sorts of things, hey, where, where has God, is that a hint? Would marriage be a hindrance or would that be a help? So if you're single, are you using the gift to the greatest potential? Or would God have you get the degree? Would God have you go on the missions trip? Would God have you lead the small group? Would God have you do something in this season with this gift that you won't be able to do later? Is there something in your own heart that God is working on you and drawing out and refining you? Are you using the season to the, its full advantage? Because you do not have to wait I know you know this and you hear this. I just want to reiterate it. You do not have to wait for life to start. Jesus promised his, his disciples eternal life. Uh, we tend to think of eternal as in quantity, like it lasts forever, and that is true. But really, the sense of the word is quality. That it is an eternally full life. Why? Because heaven has invaded earth. He's invaded your heart. He's invaded your life. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the full, right here, right now, not when you die, now. And what we do, what I'll do, is we'll put all sorts of qualifiers on that. Oh, I'll have abundant life, you know, when this happens, or I'll have abundant life when I get to this career level. I'll have abundant life when my kids do this, or when they sleep through the night. Please, when they sleep through the night. Like, I'll, 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 well, then I'll have eternal life. Or when I get married, then I'll, then I'll really have abundant life. Jesus is saying, abundant life starts now. Because the Holy Spirit is available for you to walk with him right now. So this myth that I gotta get married and then I'm really a part of the church, it's a lie. God is drawing you here. But with that, and with those sort of myths, I just wanted to give a few promises that God gives to those who are single. And specifically to those who are single and don't want to be single. You have the gift, but you don't want the gift. There's a special grace that comes in that place and a special promises that God makes to you. Here's the first. Number one, God promises you that he is enough. Psalm 16 says, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my God, and apart from you I can do no good thing. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. That those two words, portion and cup, Portion means wealth or security. In a day and age where children were seen as your retirement plan, they were seen as your social security, God goes, I'm your portion and I'm your security. And then cup was seen as pleasure, the joy of life, the excitement of life. The psalmist says, God, you're my portion, you're my protection, you're my provision, and you're also my cup. You're the joy of my life. Traditionally, things that we would think of as career or family or romance, the psalmist goes, you're my portion, God. You're my cup, and you are enough for me. Mother Teresa was one time asked by a celebrity who came to visit her at, in Calcutta, and he said, would you please pray for me? And she said, what would you like me to pray for? And he said, I'm just looking towards the future, and I just want clarity for my future. Would you please pray for clarity? And she said, I won't pray for that. She's Mother Teresa. She can do what she wants. He said, why not? She said, because God doesn't give us clarity. He calls us to trust. 
He said, it seems like you have clarity. You know what you're doing. You know what your calling is. She said, I've never had clarity. All I've ever had is trust. She said, so what I'll pray is not that God's gonna give you your future wrapped up on a silver platter, but I'll pray that you'll trust him right now when it's uncertain. Why? Because he's enough. Two, he won't leave you. Hebrews 13 says, because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Listen, I don't wanna get super heavy here, but every marriage ends either through death or through divorce. Every marriage ends. And Jesus promises this will never end. This relationship will never end. I will walk with you from here into eternity and I will never leave you and never forsake you. Three, God's promise is that he will use this season. I know it feels like it's going on forever. I know you wish it was over. If you, if you desire to get married, his promise is I will waste nothing. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Jesus told his disciples, he said, if you uh, parents in the room, if your kids ask for bread, nobody gives them a rock. If they ask for um, a fish, you don't give them a snake. Like that's parenting 101, <laughs> you know, when they ask for fish, don't give them a snake. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts, don't you think your father in heaven knows how to give good gifts? Don't, can, can you lean in, even though it's difficult, can you lean into the wisdom and love of your father in heaven and go, I think he knows what he's doing even though I can't see it. Tim Keller said, um, his, he said, if we knew what God knows, we would ex ask for exactly what he gives. So if you're asking and seeking and knocking, God loves that. He wants you to continue with that. But the, the reason why he's given you something different than what you're asking for, it's not because he does not care. It's because he knows things that you do not know. And in his wisdom, his provision, he's saying, not yet. Not yet. Why? Because I'm preparing something, because I'm preparing you, because I'm doing something. Not yet. Why? Because I give good gifts to my children. And then lastly, the last promise God makes is that he has given you a new family. Jesus told his disciples, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come. Here's the, here's the deal. <laughs> Marriage is temporary. Jesus told his disciples, when you're in heaven, uh, you're like the angels. You're neither married nor given in marriage. So every marriage will end. But you know it'll last forever? The church. The family that God has created, this group of people in this room, as weird as we are. Think of like what could get this group of people together in this room at the same time. No sports team, no politician, no hobby. Like, what is this? Oh, this is like race car, you know, remote control race car racing in here. Now, now, no hobby would get this group of people together in this room. You know what would get this group of people? Jesus. And Jesus has made this group of, fam of people family, and this family lasts into eternity, long past when every marriage has ended, except the marriage between the church and the Lamb. And so Jesus has made us family, and this lasts forever. So if you're single, Jesus goes, you may not have a strong family, or maybe you do, but now you have a hundred times brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers in this global family called the church. You are not alone. He is with you, and your brothers and sisters are with you. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to close in communion. A communion is where we take a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice, and we remember Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. If you didn't get it, if you'll pop your hand up, someone can bring it to you. But the bread symbolizes Jesus' body that was broken for us, and the juice symbolizes Jesus' blood that was poured out for us. And so what we're going to do 
is communion is when we take a time and we remember and reflect on Jesus' sacrifice. Let me just say this, because this is really important. If you could just look at me for one moment. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, we're so glad that you're here. So glad if you have questions, we want this to be a safe place to ask questions and to wrestle. We would ask though, if you're not a follower of Jesus, that you would not take part in communion. Not because we want to be exclusive, we want to be hurtful, we think this is you know, our thing and not your thing. No, because the Bible says to do this lightly, to take communion without examining yourself, actually brings judgment on you. And we don't want that for you. The way we take communion is we take it recognizing this is a symbol of Jesus' sacrifice. This is the sacrifice that has saved my soul. This is the savior that I follow with my whole heart. And so we don't take that lightly. We don't drag Jesus through the mud. We don't treat his blood with contempt. We recognize a huge sacrifice was paid so that I could be forgiven and I could be welcomed into this family. Jesus was excluded. He was executed outside the camp of Israel so that you and I could be welcomed into God's eternal family. And we don't wanna take that lightly. And so what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna give us a moment to pause, to reflect, to pray. If there's anything that's come between you and God to repent, to ask forgiveness. And then we're gonna take communion together as a family. still praying and working through some things with the Lord, feel free to keep going. Don't let me interrupt. But for those that are ready, we're going to take communion. The Apostle Paul writes, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. <clears throat> now, as we close, um, as we ended last week, we had a time of prayer for those that were married. Um, we're gonna do the same thing for those that are single. So I'm gonna ask our prayer team, or if you're an elder or on our prayer team or pastor, if you wouldn't mind lining the stage. And if you're single, we just wanna come alongside you and pray for you. Could be that you're single and you are completely content and uh, we'd love to pray for you. You don't have to get prayer only when things are going bad. If you're just saying, man, I'm in a great place, I just ask for more of the Lord's favor, more of his guidance, we would love to pray for you. Maybe if you're single and you really wanna find a spouse, we wanna help carry that burden with you. We wanna help pray for you in that regard. If you're single and you feel just like, man, help me to, I want what Mother Teresa was talking about. I just wanna trust. I wanna live fully where I'm at. I wanna get married, but at the same time, I don't wanna miss what's happening here and now. You wanna pray. I wanna use this gift to, the, to its full extent, its full capacity. We wanna pray for you. Why? because this is not just something we do on Sunday mornings. Church is a family. And for our married family, for our single family, we wanna help come alongside you wherever you're at. And so the worship team is just gonna pray kind of quietly. And uh, if you'd like prayer, we would love to come alongside you. And then we're gonna close in a time of worship. And so Jesus, thank you so much for the example you gave of a full, joyful, peaceful, powerful life, even though you were single. 
I wanna pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that are single. Thank you for those that are, for, that are content. Thank you for those that are just, Lord, they're just aware of everything you're doing and they just want more. I pray for those that are struggling right now. Lord, that you would show them what it means, that you're, you're, you're their portion and you're their cup. Lord, you're their shield and you're their inheritance. You're their closest friend and the savior of their soul, Lord. I pray in this season, there'd be a foundation and a depth that is created in this that could not come about any other way and that they will refer to and be grateful for for the rest of their lives. Lord, your gifts are not easy, but they are always good because you're a good father. And so help all of us, regardless of whether we're in a relationship or not, to trust you and to be grateful for what you give. I pray for the prayers that were about to be offered. Lord, that it would be a time of healing. It'd be a time of wholeness. It'd be a time of encouragement, literally filling up with courage and that your grace would flow through your family into your sons and daughters, Lord. In your name, we ask these things. Amen. Come on up. But otherwise, we love you and we hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Have a great day. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And as we close out, I just want to encourage you right now, in the same way that you've heard, it's just called Come Forward, Receive Prayer. If we could pray for you as you're watching online right now, I just want to offer that opportunity, that same opportunity that you heard to come to the front of the room as you're watching live or on demand right now. If there's anything at all that you'd like to talk through, receive prayer for, we have pastors and leaders who were here to, to talk with you, to pray with you. We'd love to do exactly that. And so, Certainly when it comes to singleness and also anything else that you might be going through in life right now, if you'd like to talk to someone, if you'd like to receive prayer, we're here. We'd love to do exactly that. And on our website, on our app, we have a live chat button. We can have a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. So let us know right now if there's something that we could help you with. Also, as we close out, I do just want to mention again, as you heard earlier in service, if you're looking to find that right next step, maybe to just draw closer to the Lord, maybe to get it into a greater degree of community here in the church with others, maybe both. We have um, what we call starting point. And as you're watching online, one of the best ways to find that right starting point or that right next step would be to go to lh.church slash SP, which is short for starting point. And you can see all those right next steps and just figure out which one might make sense for where you're at right now. And lastly, as we like to do every week as we close out, I just want to take a moment here just to lift up all the needs, all the requests that would be present as we're coming together. And so some of those that I would love to include here in our prayer in just a moment um, would be some that I saw in the comments as we were streaming live. And that would include a prayer request from Jeannie for her brother who had a heart attack and um, in the midst of all of that and treatment and follow-up could certainly use our prayers. And so we'll pray for him. Ramona mentioned that her friend Mike could use prayer as he's in the hospital battling cancer. And so we want to pray for Mike. Donna mentioned a request um, that her family is there visiting and she just feels like there's an opportunity there. They don't know the Lord and she'd love to lead them to Jesus. And so we would love to lift up Donna and her family. Danielle, who I know we've been praying for, has a stem cell transplant coming up in two weeks. And so we want to keep you in prayer, Danielle. And I saw Adrian mentioned a prayer request just to be able to find work. And so for the opportunity, the provision there, those are some of the needs, some of the requests that are represented. There's probably more I didn't get a chance to read off. And even as you're watching on demand, I do want to extend the opportunity just that we could all come together right now, just pause, lift up those requests that are read off and anything else that would be on our hearts as we come together right now to pray. And so I just want to invite you into that. Would you pray with us right now? Lord, uh, we just want to lift up each and every thing that I just read off to you and so much more, Lord, for all these requests, all these concerns that are on our heart in our own life and those around us. We just want to give them to you and we just seek your help. We seek your will in all of these things, Lord, and so many um, concerns when it comes to health for us and those around us. We just, we seek your will, your help, Lord, when it comes to all that would be involved in these different diseases and illnesses and treatments and conditions, Lord, would you just be at the center of each of these things? Help in a way that only you could and just um, bring us, bring those who are going through these things um, through them in a way that um, no one else could. So we just seek you for your help, for peace, for direction, for the right path forward in these different things, Lord. 
in the same way, Lord, um, just those around us, maybe, maybe there's someone on our heart right now who does not yet know you. And it's just our heart that uh, they would come to know you, to have a relationship with you. And we're even just seeking what could we do to help see that come about. And so, Lord, we just we lift that person, those people up to you right now and just ask, Lord, would you help with that? Would, would uh, you just show us anything that we could do to point them to you? In the midst of um, so many different things in life, whether it be um, career or anything else for that matter, Lord, we just seek your direction, your provision for us and all of our needs. And just ask that you would help, Lord, that you'd provide for each and every need for us. We trust you to do exactly that and just ask for your help in these different things, Lord. And so when it comes to each and everything that we're just giving to you right now, everything that I've spoken to and so much more that might be on our hearts right now, we just give it to you, Lord. And we just ask in all of these different areas and all these concerns, would you move, would you help in a way that only you could? Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, thank you so much for joining us. It's been so good to come together, and we cannot wait to see you again soon.